the joy that was set before him. Turn to the letter or the epistle to the Hebrews. No question but what this was written to the children of Israel, and most of you know the general teaching of the epistle, because it was written directly to Israel and about Israel. The theme of this letter is to give the convincing evidence that Jesus had now become Israel's high priest and that he had given himself as a sin offering. Therefore, all of the old rituals of the offering of blood of animals and goats was all put away because of this and that he had come to seal the covenants to Israel that God had made with Abraham and specifically the new covenant that God had promised to make with Israel in uh, Jeremiah 31 and so on. So uh, this is the general story of the first part of the letter to the Hebrews. Then in chapter 11 is given the names of many of the patriarchs in Israel, the fathers in Israel. And, and it says that they believed God. They believed all these things which were to come, which we are now telling you have come. So these are also witnesses of these many things which were then proven by Jesus. Then in Hebrews 12, he begins what in effect is a summing up of everything that's gone on before. And he says this, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So he's telling them what they should do now that this has all been accomplished by Jesus Christ on the cross. That the things which were promised are fulfilled, the things which are to come in the future will come because of what Jesus has done. So he says, now you live and do what you should do because of the things that have happened. Verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, the death on the cross, or putting to death of someone on the cross in those times, was reserved for the basis of criminals. This was a great shame to die on a tree, to die on a cross. And it was a terrible way to die because they were placed up there and the only wounds that they would have had, at least when they were put on the cross, was the tying and or nailing of the body to the cross so it would hang up there. This would not bring about a very quick death. Many of them would be hours and perhaps days before they would actually die. Now, Israel, or the people of Israel, as we know from other parts of the Scripture, desired, and apparently the Romans did, then go around, if the person was not dead before the end of the day, they would break the bones in his body so he would die so that he didn't hang on the tree all night, which was a greater shame. But it was nothing to look forward to. It was not just the fact that you would die from it, but you were degraded and shamed for having been hanged up on this tree or hung up on this tree in the sight of everyone. Now, it says here, and we know from other parts of the Scripture, that Jesus was God incarnate. This was God Almighty. And it says here, He endured the cross. In other words, He despised the shame. He didn't care about the shame for the joy that was set before Him. Now, what a strange way to describe the death of Jesus Christ, of God incarnate on the cross, as if, there was some great gain for him, a, great, a gain so wonderful that he willingly, gladly endured this shameful death on the cross. And it seems to imply that whatever it was he was going to gain was so great that uh, he willingly went there, that this was something that was to his good. Now, ordinarily, we think and we hear most of the preaching about Jesus Christ as the accomplishment of his death on the cross was for our good, for our gain. And we're going to read some of these uh, uh, things in the New Testament specifically about what was accomplished there in order to see what in the world this could be 
that is called here the joy that was set before Jesus. Now, verse 3 says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. So as we read these things, we're to keep before us that Jesus did endure a terrible, shameful suffering on the cross. This was no glorious day for God. In fact, we know even the weather, earthquakes, and storms, and things happened, which made it a very sad and sorrowful day. And um, in going on then and summing up in the rest of Hebrews, which we'll not read, uh, you know the story, he tells them to look forward to the things which were accomplished on the cross, and as you do it, remember, consider him that endured such a contradiction of sinners. And it seems as if what we've read so far is really a contradiction in terms. Jesus died for us. We're told that throughout the New Testament. And yet here it seems as if he died for something he would gain. All right, let's uh, read a little more in the book of Hebrews and consider what was accomplished by this terrible, shameful death on the cross. Turn to Hebrews 8, beginning in verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. This refers, of course, to the new covenant. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. So his death sealed the new covenant to Israel, which at least at this reading appears to be of gain and benefit to whom? To the children of Israel. Turn to chapter 9, verse 15. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, or the new covenant, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So here is something that would come to those which are called, those Israel people, they would receive this eternal inheritance because Jesus died on the cross. Verse 24, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, I don't believe there is a believer among us but that sees and understands and has that great hope that your sins are put away by the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. That is a joy to most of us. That is a gain that we can see and understand. And that is to our benefit. And yet we just read that Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. And yet as I read what was accomplished there, it seems as most of this is done for us, not for Jesus. Now let's go back and read some of the other epistles. We'll start right at the first one in Romans. And I'm going to be turning to quite a number of places here. You may or may not be able to keep up with me, but we'll read 
one or two or three verses here and there. Romans 5, first, beginning in verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So it seems the whole reason for his death was for us. Verse 9. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement, or the margin says the reconciliation. So here is that same word used for us. We joy in the reconciliation because we, we were alienated from God. Now, through the death on the cross, we're reconciled. A great joy to us, as he explains. Romans 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We were sinners subject to eternal death. Now through the cross, we have the gift of eternal life. Great reason for joy in Israel, I should think. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything ye are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So all blame that would come upon you for your sin and unrighteousness is taken away from you, so you'll stand before God blameless, without condemnation, when he comes. Turn to Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And listen to this verse that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So this is not some temporal thing or some temporary thing. This death on the cross was done so that God in the ages to come, in eternity, could show his grace toward us. Every time we read this, always and forever, Gain upon gain, joy upon joy, benefit upon benefit for us, for Israel, for God's people, by the death on the cross. Let's read what another writer says. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. This is a comparison again to what Jesus suffered compared to what happens to us. 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 19. For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. If you are obeying God and you suffer for it, he says, this is good. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye you shall take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, in other words, you, do, you suffer for doing good, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again, when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously, 
who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. So he reveals here, it seems as if only shame came to Jesus for the death on the cross, that all of its benefits were ours, and that we should consider this and think on it as we live. In this life, that the great advantage to us, if we do suffer, is that Jesus suffered for no sin. We might suffer for sin. Well, all right. We might suffer for doing righteousness. Praise God for that. But remember, Jesus suffered, and yet we were healed by his suffering. In the next chapter, 3, verse 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Again, the advantage shown here by another writer of the New Testament, or the epistles, that we were reconciled to God by the suffering of Jesus Christ. Let's try the book of Revelation. Turn to uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. So here we're given the names of kings and priests from this suffering on the cross, from being washed in the blood which Jesus shed in this shameful death. He washed us from sins with his own blood. He has made us kings and priests unto God. So the book of Revelation begins with the accomplishments of the cross. And to whose benefit are they? To ours. Now all of these things, as you realize, as we read these, eternal life, being washed in the blood, being raised in the resurrection, sinless, all point to the kingdom. So let's read a little about the kingdom in the book of Revelation. Revelation 7. This is one of the revelations of John about the 144,000 in Israel first. And then we read this in verse 9 and 10. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. Now John saw this vision, and then he asked the angel, what it was he was seeing. Verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light him the light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now we can agree and see the great advantage of this brief but glorious description of where we will spend eternity, what kind of a place that it is. Turn to Revelation 21. Another vision. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, 
neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Quite a description to those of us who know and believe this, that this actually will happen. When God shall wipe away all tears, no more sorrow, no more death, everything will be perfected, not just we who will be in the kingdom, but the kingdom itself. The heavens and the earth will be perfected, so there will be no more error or sin forever and ever. What a description. What a joy for us who know we are but mortal children of the dust to look forward to this great and wonderful and glorious kingdom accomplished by the remission of our sins, the reconciliation of us to God by Jesus Christ on the cross. No wonder as we read these things that all of this seems to accrue to us. What in the world could the writer of Hebrews been writing about when he was talking about Jesus suffering this terrible, painful, shameful death in order to obtain some joy, some benefit for himself that he apparently saw off in the future. Now, you know we could read scores and scores of passages in the uh, Bible that tell us the same thing over and over, that God's people, that God's creation, man, fallen from grace in sin, iniquity, and under sentence of death, has gained eternal life through the death on the cross. So I don't think I need to read any more to uh, tell you what we gain, the joy that is set before us. But let's go back now to this uh, uh, first chapter of Hebrews and see whether we can find here something that would be a great joy to the God of Israel. Hebrews 1, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now think of what I am reading here. We're speaking of an all-powerful God who was able, who is able, to bring worlds and planets and suns, great physical things that our astronomers have found, uh, no, mat no matter how large their telescope is, as the years go by, every time they build a larger one, and now they have electron telescopes, that each time they extend their vision on into the heavens, they find more stars beyond the stars that they saw before. Now, according to the Bible, if we believe the Word of God, God brought the, those things into being by speaking the Word, spoken Word of God, and the worlds were framed. Now, that's the kind of God we are talking about, who then, at a later date, did what? Came here in the form of a man and died as a man on a shameful cross to accomplish something else. Now, isn't that strange? Why didn't he just speak the word and accomplish that which he wanted to accomplish? Well, let's read on. Speaking of Jesus, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, we're going to find two phrases in here which I'm going to uh, tell you, I believe, are those things which were accomplished for the joy of God by his death on the cross. One of them was this one. When he had by himself purged our sins. That seems to be again for our benefit, right? Let's read on. 
being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, for under which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let the angels of God worship him. He's showing the exalted position that Jesus Christ was placed in by coming here, as he did, as the Son of Man and the Son of God. And of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But under the sun he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. This, I believe, is the phrase that gives us the key to the whole thing that he said about the joy that was set before him. He hath by himself purged our sins. Why? Because he loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Jesus was anointed with a joy above anything over which God had done before because he took sinful man and made him righteous. Because God loves righteousness. Now, we've discussed this before in relation to his law. And I think most of you kingdom people see it, whereas so many of our brethren in Israel do not that God's law was given to establish righteousness on the earth. And Jesus Christ died on the cross to establish on the earth that which God loves, righteousness. And the joy that Jesus saw before him was a righteous creation, man, in a righteous kingdom on the earth. And God gets joy from righteousness. Now, you can see the error and the crime, if you want to call it that, of the preaching today that God has put away his law and the lack of preaching about God writing his law in our hearts and our minds so we would do what? So we would do righteousness in the earth, in his kingdom, so God can enjoy his creation. There's no joy for God in this sin and corruption that we see on the earth. So God himself shed the necessary blood for the remission of our sins so that righteousness would come. Turn to a few places in the Psalms and let's emphasize this. Psalm 9, verses 7 and 8. But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness or in rightness. Psalm 11, verse 7. For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold the upright. Psalm 33, verses 4 and 5. For the word of the Lord is right. And all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. And here's the one we read in Hebrews 1. Return to Psalm 45, verses 6 and 7. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. Now, you know that in temporal matters we have kings upon the earth, and they have a symbol of their rulership. They call it a scepter. It's usually a rod with a globe on the top and a crown. It's different in every nation on earth. But it's a symbol that the man who holds that rod rules those people. And the scepter of God, the symbol of God, the symbol of his rulership is what? The scepter of thy kingdom is a right scepter. In other words, Righteousness is the symbol of God's rulership over his kingdom. Now turn with me to Matthew, and we'll read a little bit here in the Gospels as we have time. Matthew 1 and verse 21. 
And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. What is sin? Sin is unrighteousness. Sin is violation of God's righteous standard. And so Jesus was sent according to the very first prophecy of his purpose here in the New Testament to save Israel from their unrighteousness, which is what we read in all of the epistles, that this is what would happen. Now turn over to Ephesians. And we'll read a few things here that now I think will make more sense. Ephesians 5, in what that great joy is that Jesus, God incarnate, saw that was to come, that would be a gain to him for his dying on the cross of Calvary. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Turn to Titus, the second chapter, beginning in verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness in worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Just think of that. The joy which Jesus saw, the joy for which he endured the cross and the shame and the suffering of this terrible death was that he would have for himself a purified, righteous, sinless people. Do you realize what Pastor Emery is saying? that you are the joy for which Jesus died on the cross. Now, stop and think. What are we that God is mindful of us? And yet, as we look at these in the Scripture, His purpose was to redeem us from all iniquity that He might have us as His people without sin and iniquity. That is the joy Jesus saw on the cross. Now, I don't know about you, but that certainly doesn't make me feel exalted. It makes me feel rather humble. That God Almighty, who framed the worlds with His Word, came in the form of this creature, this man, human beings, in order to shed the necessary divine blood for remission of your sins, not only to forgive you of your sins, but to create you a sinless, righteous creature forever and ever that he might have the joy of your presence in the kingdom. That he might have the joy of your presence in the kingdom. Now, I don't know. I feel sorry. I really do. For people who do not understand the real reason that God died on the cross for us. And what this man was saying when he wrote these words. And these are men writing these words. We recognize they're the words of God. That God himself, Jesus Christ, came and made himself a disgrace before the people of the world died the death of a criminal, that men, ungodly men, could say of him, well, who was he? He was a man they killed back there 1,900 years ago because he was rebelling against authority. He was violating the precepts of the religion. He was this and he was that. They write books and they make movies of the foolishness of this man, Jesus. And you know, we're seeing a lot of that today. I had with me, I don't have it right down here, a full page from an Edmonton, Canada newspaper, a full page on the religious page, 
three articles continued on the inside about this man, Jesus, who deliberately fooled his disciples and fooled all these other people to convince them he was some sort of a divine being and that he really didn't die on the cross. He'd taken some medicine which feigned death. And then he was put in an empty tomb where there were doctors in there waiting for him and they revived him and brought him back to consciousness. And then at night they took him out and then he went to India. And they claim there's a tomb over there where Jesus Christ was buried when he died at 120 years of age. And men who hate God drag the name and the reputation of Jesus Christ in the dust and God knew this would happen and yet he despised the shame. He didn't care about this shame because he saw that he was accomplishing his purpose to have you in his kingdom. He loved us. He desired us as his companions, as his people for eternity. And he died and he let the world shame him that he might have a people before him without spot or blemish, the accomplishment of his own death on the cross of Calvary. Turn to Luke 12, verse 31, a very familiar phrase, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God and all these things shall be added unto you. And we agree with that. We believe that if we seek God's word and his truth and his kingdom, that we'll be blessed of him. But listen to verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That was the joy that Jesus Christ saw before his crucifixion. The joy in God Almighty's heart which overshadowed the shame and the curse of the cross was his pleasure in giving you the kingdom. Now I hope and I pray that you will see that his eternal purpose on the earth is to have you an ever-living creature who can do no sin, who will be righteous and enjoy righteousness as God does in an eternal kingdom here on the earth. We love him because he first loved us. The love of God toward us is awesome to contemplate. It almost is beyond our finite minds to grasp what Jesus Christ was thinking of when he suffered the shame of the cross and he was thinking of the joy he would have and you would have in his kingdom. Should we not look to Jesus as Hebrews 12 and verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's stand. Our Father, the God of Israel, we thank you for these wonderful and beautiful words wherein thou hast promised us the kingdom and told us something which is almost impossible for us to understand, that thou did this thing because you loved us and desired that we be 